Hey everybody. Today my guest is Stephen Henke. He's the Director of Brand Marketing for DAP Health and Revival Stores. He's also my neighbor and my friend. So, you know, all of us when we move to a new city, it's kind of hard to find ourselves. Well, he has some ideas on that. Give a listen. Greetings, Wilkinson here. Today my guest is Stephen Henke. He is the Director of Brand Marketing for DAP Health and Revival Stores. And we used to be in a exercise group together for a long time. Uh, say hi, Stephen. Hi. Glad to have you, neighbor. <laughs> I know <laughs> Did we you do. drive here or did you walk? I walked here. We well, live a block away from each other. Block, yeah. All right, let's hear some of your story. You know, I grew up in North Dakota. Okay. Sort of on the I guess it's a prairie. You know, it was an interesting experience because North Dakota, I think now looking back at it is a beautiful place. I mean, the skies are so big and so vast and so blue and you can just look forever and not see anything obstructing your view. I think it's a great place to live as an adult. I think it's a questionable place to grow up <laughs> because, you know, at the time, you know, this would have been the 70s. There really wasn't very much art or culture or diversity. You know, you grew up really seeing everything from a very sort of Midwestern Protestant point of view, conservative, very farm values, which are good values, uh, but, you know, aren't really inclusive of different points of view or people for that matter who might seem you know, very different than you. And so that can be a little scary when you look around and realize you're not like the 10 other people in the room and the 10 other than people room aren't comfortable with people who aren't like them. So you're gay. Well, yes, that's of course. what you're talking about, right? You know, primarily I, or not? I think primarily. Yeah. I mean, of course I was one of those kids who grew up and was so obviously gay. Everyone knew, you know, and I don't think they knew gay when I was three or four or five. They didn't have that word yet like aunts and uncles and things of that nature. But but there was a sense that there was something off or something different or something to be concerned about. I remember overhearing conversations with aunts saying uh, he's playing with all the toys for the girls in the room, but hasn't picked up any of the boy toys. So you got that sense that what you were doing or who you were wasn't okay because it, it warranted a conversation you know, a hushed conversation. Right. Yeah. And I think that has, it has an impact in terms of showing up and being your authentic self. So when you say boy toys, not in the sense that we would think of it today, the trucks and cars. <laughs> Where, in, yeah. This would G rated, right. you know, the GI Joe right. doll or the, the trucks or, you know, the little things that push dirt around. That wasn't my, that right. wasn't my groove. I wanted to play with the Barbie dolls. I wanted to play with, you know, the things that might be, now I know I was telling stories. Even at that age, I, I was more interested in toys and things that told stories because that's what I do for a living now. I'm, you know, I'm lucky to be a creative that tells stories. And that's just what I was doing. My stories back then were about things I was seeing on television, fashion, and, you know, I was watching classic films and, you know, I was just sort of trying to act that out with the toys that were available to me. Well, you could have acted out car crashes and stuff. I wasn't watching, you know, that, you, you know, that it's, it's that thing that that was not in my consciousness. You know, right. I would, I remember getting up on Saturday mornings, there was a show on CNN, which was a fashion show hosted by Elsa Clinch. And she was this like, kind of, she wasn't European, but she had a very affected sort of voice, you know, and she'd be like, I'm Elsa Clinch here at the Calvin Klein spring show where the trends are sheer, sheer and more sheer. And I just thought it was the most amazing thing. And I remember, you know, begging, please let me watch that. Right. And everybody else wanted to watch a sports game or something else. But I was dying to either watch that or what we would now call a Turner classic movie, but just a classic film, you know, that had people talking in English accents and wearing amazing clothing and doing amazing things. You know, I grew up watching Auntie Mame on PBS mm -hmm. every year when they would have their fundraiser. I would sit in my lime green beanbag chair and watch that fabulous woman and think this is what my life is supposed supposed to be like. This is what it's going to be like. And I was, when I first bought the VHS tape, maybe in my 20s, I was surprised that the movie wasn't seven hours long because it would take a whole day with all of the fundraising in between on the breaks for PBS. I would sit there for a whole day watching the film. And in my mind, 
it was a full day m- movie. That's a lot of breaks. That's a lot of breaks. <laughs> how old, How long is the movie? Like two hours, maybe? It's a little over two hours. But I think it's what's interesting is I always thought that even as I got older and, and I moved to Minneapolis, I thought when I'm in Minneapolis and I'm having a life around other gay people, it's going to be like a scene from Auntie Mame. I guess anybody who's walked into a gay bar knows it's not quite that right. fabulous. There is not that kind of people dressed up and having interesting conversations necessarily. But yeah. So... How did you come across discovering that you're uh, that you're gay? How old were you? You know, I think I always knew. I mean, I didn't have the I didn't have the language for it. I had a sense. I had a sense that I was something else. I had a sense that it was wrong. I, I had an intuition it should be not spoken about or um, expressed necessarily. Where do you think those ideas came from? I think it came from having other people that might be somewhat outside the norm. And overhearing conversations about them, look at that guy, you know, right. and, and just, it was just the the sort of like when other men in the family would talk about someone that wasn't quite a man or, you know, that sort of thing. And, and I think also just overhearing conversations about me that were of concern, you know, in terms of what I was doing or what I was interested in, you know, every, every time I think I tried to express my authentic self, it was an, it was an issue or it was a concern and, and not necessarily in a, in a, a bad way, right? They, they came from love and it came, I know the adults that were having these conversations were truly concerned, you know, mm-hmm. and they wanted to make sure that they were expressing that concern. It's what they knew. Yeah. And so I got, you get a sense. I think if you're pathetic or if you're intuitive and I am pretty intuitive. Uh, You pick up on the signals fast. You know, what I learned, and I think a lot of gay men learned this, is I learned how to shapeshift. From a very early age, I learned how to be whatever I needed to be to be invisible or to not cause a disruption, to stay safe. You know, I remember just always feeling so concerned about my personal safety. I just, I was very clear to me that if I, if I did not modulate my behavior, that there would come some harm to me. And, you know, some of it was realistic because it was very abusive. The public school system that I grew up in was very abusive for me the entire 12 years that I existed in it. And it was everything from verbal abuse to physical violence. And it was almost daily. And so I had a real clear sense that I needed to really be careful. And I, for a long time, uh, I think just pressed it down so far that I had lost my voice. I, I don't think I knew who I was anymore. But by the time I graduated from high school, I did not have a sense of self, uh, not a sense of worth, not a sense of confidence that who I was and what I was, was of value, that was of meaning. And it was good. I didn't have that sense. It took a long time to get there. What was the process of doing that? Uh, trial and error, mostly, I think. The process for me was I grew up with a certain level of sort of anxiety and depression, and that stayed with me into my kind of young adult life. And I, the mix of that and the anxiety of trying to be authentic and not feel comfortable being authentic, that anxiety mixed with the fear of what might that mean in terms of not having a job or not having shelter. For me, I just decided to pour alcohol on top of it. And I did that for a long time. And uh, starting at what age? Oh, I mean, I didn't drink. You know, we had a lot of alcoholism in my family. So I always thought, well, I don't ever want to drink because I don't want to be that. Right. And so it was later. It was later. It was after I drank in college, but it really became problematic, I would say, in my 20s, all the way through my 30s. But I just kept pouring more and more on it to, to not feel. You know, I didn't want to feel because what I felt was uncomfortable in my own skin. You know, there's that, you know, that saying, I'm I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. (laughs) And, uh, you know, that was, that was true. You know, that neuroticism of like thinking like you're, you have to always be looking over your shoulder. Now what I know is I had not dealt with the trauma of how I grew up and the fear of not being able to be myself. You know, I didn't have words for it. I didn't have a language to express that. And, you know, it took a lot of years of therapy. And finally, for me, hitting rock bottom, honestly, it was the one, two of therapy mixed with AA and the fellowship and the 12 steps. And really, as they're saying in AA, that if you want self-esteem, do esteemable acts, you know, becoming very intentional about the life I wanted to build and making sure that I was adding value and that I was uh, mindful and that I was thinking of other people was that process of just kind of building those muscles where I'd done enough esteemable acts where I finally got some self-esteem from there, you know, life kind of opened up for me. So did you have an actual coming out experience at some point? My coming out experience was uh, strangely 
odd because I lied to so many people for so long. And I remember the first time I kind of got caught on it actually was I was living with a friend of mine and, you know, she kept asking if I was gay and I kept saying, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, She and some friends had seen me making out with some. And so I was just kind of busted. That was the gradual process. But coming out to my family took a lot longer. You know, it was after college and it was, I think partly because I, I was so afraid of what that would mean and I had a feeling that it would cause a separation and it did. I mean, it did cause a fracture. You know, there was a, there was that period of time that we didn't speak really because they had to go through their process coming to terms with it of understanding how did this fit with their religion and their belief and what they had been taught. It's funny. I can look back at it now and it's not, you know, I can say it all in one sentence. The time though, it was very traumatic. I was, I had a lot of anger about it. I had a lot of resentment about it because I just, you know, I was, in this really righteous place. I mean, I was 93 marching on Washington and, you know, we were in the middle of the, we're still in the middle of the AIDS crisis. And, and I had gotten very political and I'd gotten very into social activism. And so I had very strong opinions, right? Like everyone, everyone should accept me at that point when I came out. Uh, And when people didn't, and a lot of people didn't, I'm not sure I reacted in the best possible way. I don't think I understood that for many parents, it's a grieving process of letting go of what they thought was going to be and seeing the possibility of what might be. And and everybody has to go through it on their own time, in their own terms. I wish I had done it differently, knowing that. What would you have done differently? I think I would have been a lot more patient. I think I would have asked questions instead of making pronouncements. I probably would have not insisted that they go at my speed. I, I probably would have just let them go at their own. Those are things I think we learn when we get older is you've got to, you know, you have to find that acceptance. You have to let people, you have to let people believe in a higher power of their choosing. You have to let people feel what they feel and you have to let people grow at a speed that they're comfortable growing. Um, just like, just like I did. Were your parents aware of the abuse at school and all that? They were aware of some of it because some of it was so obvious they could not not be aware. They weren't aware of all of it. When I was young, I could see the sadness that it gave them of me not having more friends at school. Uh, seeing that, I then started hiding all of the other abuse that was happening because I didn't want to, again, I, I wanted to shape shift because I didn't want to be disappointing. And that was a really, you know, I'm not sure that was the best thing to do because I think had I talked about what was happening more, I would have internalized it less and it would have had less of a sort of toxic impact in terms of my growing as a human being. You know, it really held me back, those secrets and the shame, especially the shame of not being enough or the counter to that being so little that somebody can, you know, spit on you. Because that was my reality. I mean, people were spitting on me or writing on me. They would write fag on the back of my shirt in Latin class. And ironically, the Latin teacher was a gay man who I found out later had sent a note home that I wasn't paying attention in class. And I thought, hmm. You know, but that was his experience. He was closeted, you know, so he couldn't, you know, I think it was projecting. He couldn't step in and stop the person from doing that for fear that he would have been outed himself. Did your mother not see the writing on the shirt? I think I threw that away. I think actually on the way home that day, because I had a t-shirt under it, I think I remember throwing that shirt away. Oh, wow. But they did know. I mean, they did know that things were happening. They knew things weren't right, but they didn't know what to do about it. You know, I don't think any parent does. I think you just become quite desperate when your child's not happy or your child's not fitting in. And again, for me, it was that mix of if I tell them this is happening, if I tell them that people are writing fag on my t-shirt, am I going to have to disclose that I am in fact gay? Right. Right. So it was really complicated. And I think that that sense of knowing how to, I'm calling it shape shifting, but I guess I should be more honest. It was lying. You know, I started to lie about who I was to protect what I thought was a space that was very fragile, which I know now was not at all. But I was I was a kid. I didn't know any better. Right. So professionally, how did you're at DAP now, but where did where did you start? You said you were in corporate stuff we were chatting earlier. Yeah, you know, I think 
again, everything, you know, we talked a little bit about like, uh, you know, playing with dolls and things of that, that all led to me working in retail for Target Corporation for a long time. And when I was there, I got to work with some really amazing creative women who were creative directors in the advertising department. And they, it was a masterclass. It was an absolute masterclass in creative direction and strategy and um, the experience that I had working with them. And then going on to do trend forecasting and product development and sourcing uh, all around the world. It just gave me a very unique worldview and an experience that I think very few people have because it's a it's sort of a combination of disciplines. You know, it's a little marketing, it's a lot of communication, but I think the process of developing a collection of product from the ground up, you really have a very unique view of how things are done. You know, you can right. really put your fingerprint on something and took that and went into trend forecasting where I would work with different organizations and help them understand consumer trends and product trends and how to develop ideation platforms to grow you know, in a meaningful way. And when I chose to move to Palm Springs, I think we've talked about, you know, I didn't know how to reinvent, you know, nobody knew me here. And so I I sold newspaper advertising and um, started building a professional reputation and working with some of the local nonprofits. And DAP Health was one of those nonprofits. At the time I was doing campaign work for their revival stores. And I developed a brand of uh, called Mode Furniture for their new furniture category. And so I was familiar with what they were doing. I desperately wanted to work with them, but they didn't have any openings. And a few years later, um, I got a call that said that they had an opportunity and it was as a consultant and would I be interested in coming on board. And it was just a 12 month gig. And um, I jumped at the chance. Was that with Revivals or DAP or both? It was both? with DAP Health and okay. with, with Revivals because, you know, they're the same. Revivals okay. raises funds for DAP right. Health. Yeah. Explain what Revivals is because some listeners may not know. Well, uh, Revivals is a really unique retail experience. People find themselves in the store. It's unlike any other retail experience you're ever going to have because the store is a combination of vintage and resale and brand new product, but it's displayed in a way like a Target. It's merchandised, it's clean, it's bright, it's happy, it's optimistic. And so when you're in there, what the customers tell us is that they find themselves in the product. You know, because Revivals isn't telling you what to buy or what the trend is. It's simply creating a treasure hunt. And when you come in there, you don't know what you want, but you see it and then you you connect with it. And there's something about it. And, and that's the that's the unifying story is, you know, we say find yourself at Revivals. And it, it means more than just getting in a car and coming to a store. It means come to the store and find something that uh, expresses your authentic personality. So, yeah, that's Revivals and 100 percent of the the product or the sales come back and benefit DAP Health, and that's about a million and a half dollars a year to fund comprehensive health care. And DAP has been growing like crazy. Yeah, you know, DAP is a really, DAP Health is a really special place. I had only one intention when I moved here. You know, I'd spent so many years flying around the world and doing uh, work in trend forecasting and product development, and I, I was never at home long enough to volunteer or even have a pet. And when I decided to move here, uh, and I was stupidly optimistic, in retrospect. What, what year was that? That was 2011 okay. that I moved here. And I moved here because we had a vacation home and I thought, I'm just going to go live in it. And of course, right, somebody's going to hire me right away. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew that I wanted to be part of the community. And I knew that I wanted to make an impact and have a job that had a sense of purpose that gave back in some way. You know, it took a while. It took probably four years living here before I ended up at DAP Health. But the organization um, is so unique because it's got a 40-year taproot in uh, humanitarian work, helping you know first people living with HIV AIDS. But through the years, it's expanded and added mental health, dental care, primary care, addiction services, back to work programs, harm reduction, yoga, Reiki. It is a holistic space that looks at the whole person and creates a patient-centered approach that removes roadblocks to human potential. And you know, 10,000 people call it their healthcare home today. Hmm. And it's so to get up every day and to go into work and to know that the work that I do creating communications plans and marketing and getting the message out to the community that you are welcome, you are safe, and regardless of your ability to pay, uh, you can get quality and comprehensive healthcare. It's the best thing I've ever done. And uh, when I do that work for revivals, and I know that the more people that come into the store or the more people that volunteer or donate, the more money that gets raised to fund that care 
for the person who walks through the doors of DAP Health tomorrow. I never imagined being able to, every minute of the day, know exactly what kind of an impact I'm making in the world that I'm living in. So what's life like in Palm Springs for you? Well, you know, life has been a lot. <laughs> life has been a lot of things. You know, when I first moved here and I and I had to reinvent, it was. I think a lot of people will identify when you're coming here and you've got to remake your friend group and your professional reputation. It's not easy. It's not easy to do business in Palm Springs. It's not easy to always find your tribe in Palm Springs. There's a lot of good people here. And when you find it, uh, you you will feel it. But the process of getting there can be challenging, and that was that was my experience. It was challenging when I first came here. I did a show of photography that was a fundraiser for the LGBT Center called Barbie Does Palm Springs. It was forced perspective using a Barbie doll that I loved since I was a kid. And through that experience, I met some of the most incredible people, most of whom I'm still friends with today. You know, people like Bella DeBall, who volunteers for everything. But what I saw in that experience really set the tone, because what I realized is if you want to succeed in Palm Springs, you need to constantly look for how you add value. Because if you're looking for how you can give back, how you can add value to somebody else's idea or to somebody else's organization, you will find a quality group of friends and you will find your place in this community. It is the, it's the con artists who come in here. You know, they say that Palm Springs is uh, sunny skies and shady people. That's true in a sense, because many people do come here to reinvent. And it's great if you're mindful and authentic and you create a discipline about good habits and of integrity, you can reinvent and do anything you want in Palm Springs. But I think too many people come here and they con, They're, they grift, and they show up and they say, I'm a world-class artist, right? <laughs> and they have no artistic skill. And then they just do whatever they have to do to keep the lie alive. And and so, you know, you have to sort through that. You've got it. You've got to, you know, like attracts like. And so I always tell people, Palm Springs is the same. It's two cities at the same intersection. And if you are here to add value and to grow and renew and you look in that direction, you will find it. But if you're coming to cause chaos and you want drama and trauma, that's here too. There's plenty of people that will help you find that experience. And so I don't know if it's the mountains vibrating with the energy that magnifies intention, but I always tell people, be really clear about your intention because it will be magnified, whatever it is, good or bad, it will be bigger than you think and and you won't be able to control it, you know? Mm. The universe will make it happen, but make sure you know what you want the universe to conspire on your behalf to make happen. So my experience has been really positive. I mean, I you know I love the people here. I'm really deeply involved in my recovery journey and with the very big AA 12-step community in Palm Springs, which includes so many fascinating, beautiful people who you know know what it feels like to hit rock bottom and climb back out of that hole and remake a, a life that they never want to give up again. And there's something really unique and special about that group. But it's like you and I met at, you know, an outdoor class, right. you know, and it's the same thing. We, I think there was a lot of folks that were feeling isolated and we came together during a pandemic. Thank you, Ted guys, for creating that space, holding that space for us. Uh, because it really, I mean, for me, it saved my sanity. You know, I was, I was feeling really down during the pandemic and really alone. And that class really helped me and the people I met, you know, like you and Jace and a few others, some of, I, I hope I know these people forever, but that's a gift. I mean, that's right. an absolute gift. And that's a good example. You know, Ted decided to give back to the community. And from that, Jace took the example, as you know, our friend, and he's now giving back with his own class in a different part of the community and he's making an, his own impact. And so right. I love that. I love that ability. You know, he didn't have that experience or the, the talent before, but he got his certificate and now he's doing what he wants to do. Right. Love it. So you're married. I am married. Yeah. To whom? I, his name's Greg. Where'd you meet Greg? I met Greg on the way to a matinee of the Little Mermaid. Oh, true story. <laughs> I know, right? I'm sorry. I wish it was like a. It's not a grinder story, kids. Oh. Uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 really it's I'm really ashamed of the story. But no, we were both working at Target. We didn't know each other. Target had decided to do a line of product based on the film and was doing a showing and had invited, you know, departments that were supporting those product lines. And yeah, I just I met him at a coffee shop with a mutual friend before the movie. I saw him again the next day at the Minnesota AIDS Walk. And I remember turning to my friend Katie and saying, Look at that guy. And she's like, Yeah. And I said, I'm gonna marry him. 
No way. And she said, what's his name? And I said, Greg. She said, what's his last name? And I said, I'll tell you when I find out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously. True story. True story. And yeah. I, and I was, I, I was like, I think a dog with a bone. I, you know, I, I knew, I knew instinctually again i have good intuition and when i listen to that intuition it doesn't fail me i knew that he was better than me i just somehow knew that he would he would make my life better he would make me better call it magical thinking but it's true he is that person he's a, he's a much better person than i am so i'm right, lucky so you talked to katie you got to tell us a little more details than what happened well i mean i talked to katie and luckily you know when you work at target people have coordinators or assistants and i just reached out to that department's assistant and i was like what other company functions is he planning to go to and i would just accidentally show up at those you know events time after time after time after time and then i don't know how long it took but i think i sent him an email or something and i, I said oh i it was great seeing you at such and such. And, right. and he sent a note back saying, don't you think it's about time we go on a date? My coordinator uh, has been showing me all of your emails. So I thought, you know, I was being very sneaky and crafty, right? Very underground. And meanwhile, well, you I, emailed her or him, wasn't it? Yeah, right? it, was a, it was a guy named Ambrose and Ambrose so, was also gay. So you were getting info from Ambrose and he was showing the emails to the, yes. to the to Greg? Yes. Oh. I know. I know. You can't <laughs> That's trust a the, little you can't trust red the red face stuff there. Well it's you know, I mean now you look back, it's fine. I mean again you just you don't ever you know you don't ever know. You don't ever right. know what's gonna happen. Right. You don't ever know. You know, I mean this is this is a true story. You know, I talked about high school. There was a guy in high school who I would look at and I would think say to myself, if I only knew him, my life would be better. Like it wouldn't be so bad, right? And uh, because I thought he had a perfect life, he had the perfect friends, he had the perfect hair, he had the perfect clothes. And I never did get to know him. Never, never, never. And, you know, life went on. And, you know, I'm, I'm in my late 30s at this point, And I walk into my first my second meeting, because my first meeting of AA was here in Palm Springs. That's the meeting that saved my life. But I walked into my second meeting in Minneapolis, and he was the secretary of that meeting. The guy you thought was perfect? The guy that I thought was perfect. The guy that I thought in high school was would perfect. change my life right. if I just knew him. And I asked him to go for coffee after that meeting, and we had a conversation, and I learned that his life was not what I thought it was in high school at all. And oh. he became my first sponsor. He is, he worked with me my first five years of recovery. And so, it's so, you know, the universe is always conspiring on our behalf. It is true. It was not true in 1983, 84, 85, but it was true at that point that because I knew him, my life got better. And so, but not is, in the way you thought. Not in the way I thought. You right. know, and that's the weird thing. You know, it's like, the universe has a mind of its own. But I mean, that I had that, isn't that odd? I had that intuition at 14 right. or 15 years old. I knew it. I just didn't know everything about the story. Right. You're right. It took a while to get there. And, and uh, yeah, I'm still so grateful for his presence in my life. Cool. But I think it's there's a serendipity there. Right. I love when the universe speaks to us. So uh, where did you go on your first date with Greg? We went Cheesecake to... Cheesecake Factory, right? No, we went to a restaurant <laughs> called Monte Carlo, which was an old sort of supper clubby restaurant, but we sat on the patio. And I think we just had appetizers. Yeah, I think we just had appetizers and talked. I mean, he was very old fashioned. Yeah, it was a proper... In what way? Well, I mean, it was a proper date. It was, uh, there wasn't going to be any funny business. It wasn't going to be anything scandalous. It was going to be appetizers and a drink and goodbye. Yeah, it was a lot of that. We dated for a very long time. So like in, a, tra in a traditional sense, um, months and months and months before the lid came off the cookie jar. So how long was it before you said, oh, there's something here? Well, I thought it right away. I think right. it took him longer. I think he, you know, he was in a different place in his life where he didn't feel the need to date necessarily. I think he thought I could take it or leave it. Uh, probably about, we were probably dating for about six months before okay. we knew something was there. Is he your age, older, younger? What six is years older. Okay. Yeah. About the same then. About six the same. Years, eh? Yeah. Six years, nothing, right? <laughs> right. He looks younger than I do. Really? He does. Yeah. He takes better care of himself. What does he do? He buys product for a baby store. Really? Yeah. He works from home and he works for a friend of his and uh, he he buys product. And, you know, he was a senior buyer at Target and now he's buying product, working from home and being able to uh, spend time with our dogs and still do the work he loves doing. Cool. So where do you go from here? What's up? That's a good question. You know, um, it's uh, I've had just an, an incredible experience living in Palm Springs. You know, I've done so many things that I 
would have never had the opportunity to do had I stayed in Minneapolis. I still love Minneapolis. I miss it. I go back as often as I can. But, you know, I moved here. I begged to get on the chamber board. At some point, I became president of the chamber. You know, I got the gig at DAP Health. Now I started working with different media in a PR sense. Suddenly, I was reporting or corresponding for NBC. When they let me, I actually report the news. No media training at that point. No sense that I should have been able to do it. I just, I think what's next is that I I continue to do what I've been doing. And that is, I'm a big believer in replacing fear with curiosity, saying yes, you know, say yes, because I don't know how things are going to turn out. I never know, but I know that I have the work ethic and I know I have enough raw talent that it's not going to be bad, right? No matter what, it's not going to be bad. I'll, I'll make it work somehow. And so I hope I keep just saying yes to new experiences, just keep opening doors. I think there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of things that I haven't done that I still will be doing in the future. I don't know what that means. I really don't. I, I, I think the power and the energy of the universe has just sort of pulled me along so far. Right. I think as long as I trust in that and, and just, you know, there's, there's two things, you know, because of the story I told you of how I grew up. There's two questions that I ask myself almost every day. Where do I belong? Because I'm, there are days where I'm not sure where, where that is. Do I feel like I belong? And that's more of a question of how are, do I have the right people around me? Are they affirming who I am in a way that I feel it, right? That's my biggest driver. You know, I want to feel it. I want to be around quality folks who help me be a better version of myself. And the second question I always ask before I say yes to something is, can I clearly see how I would add value? if I say yes to this. And so if it's uh, serving on a committee or a board or it's taking a job, I always ask myself those two questions, you know, will I belong? And can I see clearly how I add value? And so, you know, if, if I can do both of those things, it's a yes. If I can't, this will be the only time I say this, it's a fuck no. I, you know, it's a hard, hard fuck no. I, right. you know, and I've, I've left opportunities and I've left spaces and places where I either didn't feel like I could be my authentic self, or I didn't feel valued, or I had just run out of the ideas to add value. And you do. I mean, we aren't gumball machines that have endless ideas. And so sometimes you need to step away from something and let somebody else sit in that chair and, and bring new ideas. Uh, and that will probably happen, you know, someday in every part of my life. And hmm. I'll move on to a new experience and do something else in the Valley. And it'll be the same though. It'll, it'll be the same. The intention hasn't changed. I still want to be part of the community and I still want to get up every day and know that what I do has meaning and purpose. Right. I think it's so important. Is there anything you were wanting me to ask you or that you wanted to talk about that we haven't touched on? Oh, we haven't talked about <laughs> So many things. I thought you were going to ask like about my experience as a drag queen and I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I don't think so. I don't know. What didn't I tell you that you want to know? What were you afraid I was going to ask you? What was I afraid? (laughs) Uh, Well, I was on the spot, right? I was afraid that you were going to ask me, you know, to be photographed, you know, because I I could sense just sitting across from you that you were, you had that moment as a photographer where you're like, I haven't photographed him. And I thought that might be what you'd ask, but you know, no, of course not. I have to. I have to stay fully dressed at all times. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I occasionally okay, photograph people with clothes on. Okay. So well, that that would be a yes then. <laughs> In fact, I want to take your picture for the thumbnail on the uh, on the podcast. Perfect. So I usually ask people, although you've already threw out a whole bunch of nuggets there, but uh, is there any lessons that you'd like to reiterate? I don't, you know, listen, I'm not the smartest person in the room. I don't have lessons and I, I seldom give people advice, but I will say there was a moment before I got sober when I was traveling for work. And do you remember the makeup artist, Kevin Aquan? Kind of rings He was bell. very tall. He was very right. big. He was a very big personality. And there was a store selling his new makeup line and it had uh, stenciled in their store window one of his quotes, you know, the quote said, today I see beauty everywhere I go, in every face I see, in every single soul, and sometimes even in myself. Wow. And I remember standing in the streets of Chicago crying at the time because I could not say that that was true of me. I was so blinded by my life experience that I hadn't yet dealt with, you know, by alcoholism and by really ridiculous low self-esteem. But I think about that quote a lot, you know, mm. and I and I think um, it comes back to me all the time because if I'm getting off base or I'm off my center, I think about that quote and I think, am I looking for beauty everywhere I go in every single face and in every single soul? It really right-sizes me. You know, it's that one thing cool. that I say, okay, yeah, I'll do this. And, and what I've come to understand is that's how you get to the sometimes even in myself. You know, when you see it in someone else, when you look for it, you assume good intent, you find the best in yourself too. 
Those are good words. Thanks for sharing. And thank you for coming in. Really appreciate it, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you.